In the Kuban region of the USSR, on the shore of the Azov Sea, 40 kilometers from the city of Yesk, there is a small fishing village located around a group of grain elevators. It is called Peraprava. We moved there in the beginning of March 1927. Snowstorms were still raging over the ice-covered sea. The snowdrifts enveloped our cottage almost up to its eaves, and in the morning we couldn't get out without a shovel. But the cottage was warm, heated by chips of horse dung that we bought from the local people. The chips were easy to ignite and held heat for a long time. And so the cold winter passed. The sun warmed the earth, and with the spring thaw, the steps came alive. The steppe grass turned green and began to grow quickly. The ice began to move on the sea and was then swiftly carried out by the strong current. Finally, the swans flew in and settled themselves on the marshes of the bay. This was a sanctuary for migrating birds and a resting place for those that were flying further north. The tired and hungry flocks of geese and ducks would settle on the water, noisily flapping their wings and quacking so loudly that we would be awoken from our sleep. While living in Mankovka, my husband was the director of the Mankova Katatvensk Technical School, located not far from the railway station. Someone had informed the authorities during a card game where tongues tend to wag that he allegedly said, the Kremlin has become inhabited by little long noses. This was symbolic of certain little insects that live in the Kuban region and exist by eating the kernel of wheat grain. Finally, he had to forfeit his rights and leave this area where we were all living, along with resigning as director of the school. Moreover, he was put under house arrest until further notice. Since there were no guards assigned to watch my husband, he took advantage of the situation by jumping out of the window and escaping. Before anyone noticed, he went to the Cherkov station and left by train to the above-mentioned Paraprava in the Kuban. The city was beginning to experience unemployment. Since my husband was unable to find work, we decided to move on to Mariupol. This came at a time when the new economic policy, NEP, was coming to an end. Although the state was struggling to organize collective farms, there were still many free merchants, chasniki, working at the Mariupol market. Because of the high unemployment, no one had money. We found ourselves spending the last of our rubles and looking toward an uncertain future. While searching long and hard for work, my husband registered at the unemployment office as required. Almost immediately he was arrested and then reminded about statements that he made about those little long noses. By that time, my father had already passed away, and here I was with two little children, without resource or assistance, and with little hope of finding a job. I began looking in offices, factories, at construction sites. Everywhere I heard the same response, there is no work. With the advent of unemployment registration, the authorities introduced the so-called record of service. The huge employment hall could not accommodate all of the unemployed, and the lines moved very slowly. To get to the registrar's window, one had to spend almost the entire day waiting in line. Do you have your record service? No, I haven't worked before. Where does your husband work? Oh, I see. Come back tomorrow. But I have hungry children. I'll take the hardest job. I said come back tomorrow. Next. The crowd had already pushed me away from the window. So it was. Once in a while, I was able to work for a day, hauling bricks to a construction site or cleaning up stores. This was not sufficient work because even a full day's pay was barely enough to buy a little bread. And so we starved. Mommy, did you bring us some bread? No, my children, I couldn't find work today. Well, all right, then bring us some tomorrow. 
This was how my children often greeted me. It happened that one day I ran into a girlfriend from high school. Olga was already married with four children and had been living in Mariupol for some time. Her husband had been seriously ill and bedridden. They had their own little house that they built themselves out of a clay and straw mixture. If you like, move in with us, Olga said to me. You might even be able to find work here. Many of the Greeks are hiring painters to whitewash their animal barns. I became overjoyed at the prospects of that situation. And after thanking our former and kind hosts for sheltering us, I took my children and our belongings and moved in with Olga's family. I approached each job with neither resistance nor joy. After a while, I grew used to the work and appreciated my earnings and the food because it was so entirely sufficient that my children even gained a little weight. I was concerned, however. My work was seasonal, and with the advent of cold weather, all of this could come to an abrupt end. Mariupol was the main city of our region, and our office was considered the regional one. The city councils that belonged to our office were called the periphery. All the farmers living on the periphery whether they owned livestock or not, were expected to contribute a precise amount of meat to the government agency. In addition, the state took their surpluses and levied fines down to the last cow or goat. They were labeled as unwilling and evil tax evaders. For the first time in my life, I actually saw a cow cry. An elderly couple was ordered to give up their cow to the state. We cried the whole way, the old man said. My wife was hugging and stroking her Mashka. And Mashka seemed to understand where she was being taken. You see, she's still crying. And sure enough, I could see tears coming from the eyes of the cow. After stroking this cow, the old people, deprived and crying, shuffled back the ten kilometers to their village. The regime that supposedly represented the worker peasant had just robbed them. The arrest policy now expanded to include the Ukrainians and the Poles. The innocent were dragged away. In every family, there was heartbreak and tears. The Bolsheviks forgot at what cost they came to power. Then an official arrived from Moscow and made some kind of foggy speech about Germany's intentions for expansion. We ridiculed the speech, saying, Let the Germans jabber away. But it seemed that something was going on in the upper political circles. But because we had grown accustomed to slogans such as, Be on guard, and The enemy is at the gates, we did not take the speeches very seriously. Most of us just waited for the obligatory lectures to end so that we could go home. Then the announcement was made to the entire civilian population that because of strategic considerations and the experience in other cities, we had to begin digging anti-tank trenches at a distance of a rifle shot from the city. To execute this order, the entire populace, regardless of age and sex, was needed, anyone capable of holding a shovel. In 1939, the Germans tore Poland to pieces in a few days, descending on the country like an evil hurricane. The Poles ran toward the border for safety and were met there with bayonets. 12,000 of the Polish army's finest had to take refuge in Katyn Forest. Nor was Russia spared the fate of Poland. The German vultures swept down on the Russian soil crumbling and burning everything in their path and bringing death. With the war came the flood of refugees. As soon as the first bomb was dropped on Poland, bread and all other products disappeared from the market. To receive a quarter of a pound of margarine, I stood in a line with 7,000 people, and behind me there were at least as many. We stood day and night and got nothing. We never received any mail from the front. Similar to concentration camps, the policy of no mail was supposedly invoked. 
because if the letters were intercepted, the enemy would be able to learn about plans and the size of military force. Also, rumors from the letters could create panic among the population. But even without the mail, there were constant rumors that our soldiers were on the run. Those who escaped told of entire regiments surrendering to the enemy. In 1941, the city was soon surrounded by the Germans. At the port, the elevator containing grain for the city was set afire by the Russian army before their retreat. They did not want to leave it for the enemy. The Germans were not about to give it to the populace as evidenced by the fact that the railway cars full of stolen Russian goods were sent to Germany in their first days of occupation. Bread baked from the burnt grain, crunching like pieces of broken glass, was distributed to the people for about two or three days, after which we received nothing. Russian currency was not honored, and the German mark had not yet appeared. If one had some things to exchange for food, the only food was corn. Up to now, the Jews had been left alone and walked about freely, although the authorities were keeping track of them. On a certain day, old man Gorlin, who had been a neighbor, came knocking on my door and informed us that the Germans had ordered the Jews to pack up their belongings and prepare to leave. It was surprising that people did not attempt to leave while they had the chance. The refugees, who we referred to as Polacks, were actually Polish Jews. They knew all about the ghettos and the various incidents of persecution, but they refused to believe what they were being told. One Jewish acquaintance told me, Why should we leave? We're not some kind of rich folks. We've worked all of our lives. We sent our daughter away, but we're not going. All of my co-workers did the same, remaining for fear of losing their jobs. By evening of the same day, we watched as they were led down the street toward the military barracks outside of the city. By the time we ran outside, the first column had already passed the house. In front were the rabbis, the doctors and their families, and the Jewish intelligentsia. Next were the elderly, supported under the arms. The sick were on stretchers, and the children walked along carrying knapsacks and small bundles. The procession moved very slowly. It was difficult to believe that they would shoot down seven and a half thousand people for no reason. But several days later, they were executed and buried in those same trenches that we had dug around the city before the Germans arrived. A vile, inhuman, and criminal act had taken place in history. Several people died in our building. The Jews had been killed, and the yard became empty. My children and I were sent to Germany. At the Mariupol station, we said goodbye to everything that had been dear to us, and we said goodbye forever. The railway car was filled to the limit, and the doors were bolted shut with a padlock. One of the men in the prison was a German soldier, a deserter. He had been arrested because he went home to visit his sick wife and children without permission. He told us about the battle at Stalingrad and the German defeat on all of the fronts, the armies destroyed and retreating. He said that half of Germany was already in American hands. We listened in amazement, not believing our ears, but saying nothing. We did not want to miss a single word of his account. Throughout our entire four-year imprisonment, we had not known what was happening on the military front. We stood for hours in the hallways with the other prisoners, talking, without being told to return to our cells. <laughs>